Thank you. Uh, I have two missions here today. The first is to um, tell you something about pollen, I hope, and to convince you that it's more than just something that gets up your nose. Uh, secondly, to convince you that every home really ought to have a scanning electron microscope. <laughs> pollen is a flower's way of making more flowers. It carries male sex cells from one flower to another. This gives us genetic diversity, or at least it gives the plants genetic diversity. Um, it's really rather better not to mate with yourself. That's uh, probably true of humans as well, mostly. Um, pollen is produced by the anthers of flowers. Uh, each anther can carry up to 100,000 grains of pollen. So it's quite prolific stuff. And it isn't just bright flowers that have pollen. It's also trees and grasses. And remember that all our cereal crops are grasses as well. Here's a scanning electron micrograph of a grain of pollen. The little hole in the middle we'll come to a bit later, but that's for uh, the pollen tube to come out later on, very tiny tube. So that's 20 micrometers across that uh, pollen grain there. That's about a 50th of a millimeter. And not all pollen is quite so simple looking. This is Morena. This is a, uh, a plant which I've always thought to be rather tedious, uh, named after Morin, who was an enterprising French gardener uh, who uh, issued the first seed catalogue, actually, in 1621. But anyway, take a look at its pollen. This is amazing, I think. That little hole in the middle there is for the pollen tube. And when the pollen finds its special female spot in another Morena flower, just on the right species, what happens? Like I said, pollen carries the male sex cells. <laughs> uh, perhaps you didn't realize that plants have sex. They have rampant, promiscuous, and really quite interesting and curious sex, really, <laughs> a lot. My story is actually not about plant propagation, but about pollen itself. So what are pollen's properties, I hear you ask? First of all, pollen is tiny. Uh, yes, we know that. It's also very biologically active, as anyone with hay fever will understand. Now, Pollen from plants which are wind-dispersed, like uh, trees and grasses and so on, tend to cause the most hay fever. And the reason for that is they've got to chuck out masses and masses of pollen to have any chance of the pollen reaching another plant of the same species. Here are some examples. They're very smooth, if you look at them, of tree pollen that uh, is meant to be carried by the wind. Again, this time sycamore, uh, wind-dispersed. Uh, so trees, very boring flowers, uh, not really trying to attract insects. Uh, cool pollen, though. <laughs> this one I particularly like. This is the Monterey pine, which has little air sacs uh, to make the pollen carry even further. Remember, that thing is just about 30 micrometers across. Now, much more efficient if you can get insects to do your bidding. This is a bee's leg uh, with the pollen glommed onto it from a mallow plant. And this is the outrageous uh, and beautiful flower of the mangrove palm, uh, very showy to attract lots of insects to do its bidding. And the pollen has little barbs on it, if we look. Now, uh, those little barbs uh, obviously stick to the insects well, uh, but there's something else that we can tell from this photograph, and that is that you might be able to see a fracture line across what would be the equator of this if it was the Earth. Uh, that tells me that it's uh, actually been fossilized, this pollen. And I'm rather proud to say that this was found just near London and that 55 million years ago, London was full of mangroves. <laughs> Isn't that cool? <laughs> OK, so this is another species evolved to be dispersed by insects. You can tell that from the little barbs on there. All these pictures were taken with a scanning electron microscope, actually in the lab at Kew Laboratories. Uh, no coincidence uh, that these were taken by Rob Kessler, who's an artist, and I think it's someone with a design and artistic eye uh, like him has managed to uh, bring out the best in pollen. Now, all this diversity means that actually you can look at a pollen grain and tell what species it came from. And that's actually quite handy if you uh, maybe have a sample and you want to see where it came from. So different species of plants grow in different places, and some pollen carries further than others. So if you have a pollen sample, then in principle, you should be able to tell where that sample came from. And this is where it gets interesting for forensics. <laughs> 
pollen is tiny, it gets onto things and it sticks to them. So not only does each type of pollen look different, but each habitat has a different combination of plants, a different pollen signature, if you like, or a different pollen fingerprint. By looking at the proportions and combinations of different kinds of pollen in a sample, you can tell very precisely where it came from. This is some pollen embedded in a cotton shirt, similar to the one that I'm wearing now. Now, much of the pollen will still be there after repeated washings. Where has it been? Four very different habitats might look similar, but they've got very different pollen signatures. Actually, this one's particularly easy. These were all taken in different countries. But pollen forensics can be very subtle. It's being used now to track where counterfeit drugs have been made, where banknotes have come from, to look at the provenance of antiques and see that they really did come from the place that the seller said they did. And murder suspects have been tracked using their clothing, in, certainly in the UK, to within an area that is small enough that you can send in tracker dogs to find the murder victim. So you can tell from a piece of clothing to within about a kilometre or so where that piece of clothing has been recently and then send in dogs. And finally, and rather in a rather grisly way, the Bosnia war crimes. Some of the people brought to trial were brought to trial because of the evidence from pollen, which showed that bodies had been buried, exhumed, and then reburied somewhere else. I hope I've opened your eyes, if you excuse the visual pun, <laughs> to some of pollen's secrets. This is uh, horse chestnut. There's an invisible beauty all around us, each grain with a story to tell, each of us, in fact, with a story to tell from the pollen fingerprint that's upon us. Thank you to the colleagues at Kew, and thank you to palynologists everywhere. The electric grid was conceived in the age of Edison, designed in the age of Eisenhower, installed in the age of Nixon, and it has not been upgraded since. It's just not able to keep up with modern needs. Well, the notion of the smart grid is using what we have better, making do with what we've got and not build so much new infrastructure. Software at the gateway between generation and transmission can solve that problem. The smart grid is actually a bunch of smart devices connected over a network to a bunch of computers. And the computers crunch all this data and then are able to optimize the system. What we're working on is helping utilities see what's actually happening in real time in terms of the flow of electricity between all those devices. Benefits the consumers, benefits the environment, all because of things we can now see that we couldn't see before. On the Olympic Peninsula, p ls goal was to make the smart grid tangible. We were taking home area networks as a way of sending messages to the homes and to the devices in the homes about when they should run or not run. There was one other modem here that captured wirelessly the reports from the different elements. We saved approximately during this time 15% of our electric bill. If we can do that for everybody in the country, we're talking about saving $100 billion worth of infrastructure that we won't need to build. IBM has been the first big company to really see the opportunity to marry information technology with the grid. There are similar things going on in South America, Asia, in Europe. We've been working with Malta to make both the water and electricity systems much more efficient. It is a model for how we can then bring that to other larger geographic areas. The path forward to a smart grid is actually quite clear. We upgraded our telecommunications networks, our satellite networks, and we can do the exact same thing uh, with a smart grid. A wind plant will go up and down by the minute. A solar plant will go up and down as clouds go over. So having a grid that can flex itself and manage these, these kinds of things is critical. We need to be planning for the kind of future that we say we want, which is an era of cheap, reliable, clean electricity for decades to come.